Hey guys, uh, welcome to your first day of virtual learning. Uh, I'm not going to lie, it's kind of weird to record this and you guys not be there, but I decided we're just going to start with chapter 16 all over again since some of you missed section 1 and we only did the first page. So we are going to start talking about the Civil War. So just to review, we know that by February 1861, seven states left the Union and formed the Confederacy. And four states joined in April. They joined the Confederacy in April, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas. Now, the reason why they did this is because Lincoln called for Union troops after Fort Sumter. And I know you remember how many he called for. If you're thinking 75,000, you're right. So these states, these four states, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas, they added a lot of needed supplies and troops that were going to help the South in the long run. So the capital of the Confederacy was Richmond, Virginia. That's a change from Montgomery, Alabama. They moved it to Richmond, Virginia because Richmond was only 100 miles south of D.C. and they definitely wanted to be closer to the Union. So let's talk about border states. There are four border states. And they're important because even though they had slavery, slavery was legal in all four of these border states, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, they all stayed in the Union, but the people who lived in the state were very divided over who to support. Now, Lincoln had to be careful. He didn't want any of these states to defect, quote unquote, and secede and join the Confederacy. So he wanted to make sure they stayed and they all had something important to them. So take a look at this map. You can see the gray are Confederate states. You can see the light blue are Union states. And then you see the dark blue, those are Union territories. So they weren't actually states, they were just territories. Okay, so let's talk about what's important from each of the border states. Missouri controlled parts of the Mississippi River and major routes west. Kentucky controlled the Ohio River. That's the northern border of Kentucky. Delaware was close to Philadelphia, which is a very important manufacturing city in the Union. And Maryland is probably the most important one of all. It had a lot of railroads, important railroad lines, um, it had the capital DC. So imagine if Maryland seceded into the Confederacy, literally the capital would have been surrounded by a Confederate state, which would be obviously not a very good thing. All right, so an example of something that happened in Maryland was um, a mob in April of 1861 attacked Northern troops and um, they weren't doing anything. They just, they were there and they were attacked and they rioted and they burned railroad lines and they cut the telegraph lines to Washington. And so Lincoln had to be really careful. And so what he did was he used his power as president to suspend constitutional rights and he basically arrested anyone in Maryland who supported secession. I know that sounds kind of crazy to suspend constitutional rights, but it was a very difficult time. And so sometimes presidents have to really push the boundaries of their powers. All right, so the border states did stay with the Union. Unfortunately, though, a lot of the people who lived in the border states left and joined Southern armies, which is not really a surprise, um, but that's what happened. But there were people in the Confederacy who did not agree with seceding from the Union, and a lot of those people were in Virginia. So, you know, we've talked about this whole time that Virginia was one giant Virginia, but there was a group of people in the western part of Virginia who actually did not want to join the Confederacy. And so they banded together. It was 48 counties. They banded together and they organized themselves into a new state and they joined the Union as West Virginia. Now, of course, you know the Union just took them as soon as they possibly could. The fastest state to become a state is West Virginia. And um, they kind of took a play out of the Confederate States playbook. All right, so let's talk about what advantages the North had over the South. Now, on paper, the North was definitely the favorite to win in this war. They had everything going for them. The South, definitely the underdog. So let's talk about eight northern advantages, okay? One was a larger population. Obviously, the more people you have, the more people you have to fight. Two, more industry. That means manufacturing. I mean, we're talking about, of all the manufacturing that happened in the United States in 1860, 90% of it happened in the North. So obviously, that's going to help out. The North had more resources, everything from railroads to trains um, to any other resource that could be used. The North just had more of it. The North had a better banking system. 
They're obviously going to be financially more dependent than a brand new country, quote unquote, the Confederacy. They had more ships. They had more loyal Navy members. I mean, what kind of a Navy is the South going to have? Really not a very good one. Um, they had a more efficient railway system. This is going to be important when it comes to delivering troops and supplies and all the other things that you would need to happen during a war. And probably one of the best advantages that the North had was Abraham Lincoln himself. He was uh, definitely the man for the time. And um, it's one of the reasons why he's considered one of the best presidents in United States history. Okay, so let's talk about some disadvantages for the North. Because even though they were the favorite on paper, they had some disadvantages. One, the aggression would have to come from them. The Union would have to invade and hold the South. Uh, this becomes evident when you look at what the goals were for each side, okay? We'll talk about that in a second. But, so, a disadvantage for the North, the Union would have to invade and hold the South. A disadvantage for the North also was that many people believed that the South actually had a good chance of winning, even though on paper they were considered the underdog. Okay, what about the South? What kind of advantages do you think the South would have? Okay, one... Support for the war in the South was very strong. So, majority of the white population in the South supported the war. This is not the case in the North. It was still, you know, a little bit of a, you know, maybe we should just let them go. But in the South, strong support was definitely an advantage. Second, you have uh, most of the fighting would be done on their own land. And we've known this for a long time, that when you fight on your own land, it is advantage majority of the battles are going to happen in the South because the North, they have to be the aggressors. They have to go down and they've got to control the South to bring them back. Okay, last advantage for the South, superior military leadership, especially Robert E. Lee. Now at the beginning of the war for the first few years, the leadership is going to far out um, outdo the Northern leadership. And uh, we'll talk about that as we start talking about battles in the next sections. Okay, what about the disadvantages for the South? There are several. So Southern disadvantages include a smaller population. I know you might think, you know, gosh, the country's kind of split in half. Wouldn't it be the same? No, you had bigger cities in the North. And plus, they didn't count any of the slave population in the South. So smaller population, two fewer factories. Clearly, we know the South was all about agriculture and not industry. Three, fewer resources, including an inferior railroad system. This is actually really key. Fewer railroad tracks and fewer trains really hurt the South in the long run. Um, and another disadvantage was states' rights. Like, the, Remember how we've talked about that the South was all about their states' rights? They didn't want to lose slavery. But this belief in states' rights actually hurts them as far as a strong central government conducting a war. Strong central governments are really helpful in wartime because someone has to, you know, make the plans and oversee the entire army. And so during the Civil War, the South really hung on and clung to the idea that states' rights was the way to go, states being more powerful than the federal government itself. And this made it difficult to oversee and basically execute a war plan. So there you go. Now, what about our, what are the goals of each side? So the North goal and the South goal were obviously totally different. The North, their first goal was actually not to end slavery. That was not Lincoln's first goal. His first goal was to bring the Southern states back into the Union. That was the most important thing. Now, later, it's going to take a right-hand turn, and it is going to be about ending slavery. But at the beginning of the war, that's not what it was. And, of course, the Union's plan had three parts. All good plans have three parts, guys. We've said that before. Okay, so what is the first part of this three-part plan? Okay, first, they were going to blockade southern ports to prevent supplies from entering and cotton from being exported. Now, I know, I see, if we were in class, I'd say, guys, why would it be really important for the North to keep the South from exporting cotton? And I know someone would be raising their hands and saying, well, because that's how they made most of their money. And you're right. Cotton was king. And so if they can keep the South from exporting cotton, they can keep the South from making money. So blockade southern ports with all the boats that they had since the South hardly had any. OK, 
Okay, the second part of the plan was gain control of the Mississippi River to cut southern supply lines and split the Confederacy. Okay, the last part of the plan is capture the Confederate capital of Richmond. All right, so that's the North's three-part plan to bring the southern states back into the Union. Now, what, what do you think the South's goal is? Well, they only had one. Win recognition as an independent nation. Remember, if the North said, fine, go be your own country just to our South, then we would have had a country, the Confederacy, with slavery for a time, and a union without slavery. But the North wasn't going to let that happen. So how is the South going to achieve this goal of winning recognition as an independent nation? Okay. And then they also wanted to preserve their way of life, which included slavery. Now, they also have a three-part plan. The first part is holding on to as much territory as possible until the North got tired of fighting. The second part of their plan was having Great Britain and France pressure the North to end the war. The third is going on the attack by moving North to threaten Washington, D.C. Now, this sounds really familiar. At least it should be because it's very, very close to the strategy that the American colonies had when they fought Great Britain. They were thinking it worked then, maybe it could work now. We're going to see how it plays out when we talk about the battles. All right, so who fought in this war? Literally, brother against brother, parent against children, neighbor against neighbor, friend against friend. I mean, you have a lot of these military leaders. They went to school together. They went to West Point together. They fought in other battles together. And at this point, they're going to be divided. Soldiers came from all walks of life. Now, even though the average age of a Civil War soldier was 25, 40% of them were younger than 21. Now, at first, a soldier's term was 90 days, but when the war doesn't end quickly, that's going to change very, very fast. Okay, so let's talk about some nicknames. Did you know that the South were called rebels? That's right. Rebels, Confederates, they're all the same. They, had, they started with about 112,000 soldiers. The North, the Union... Yankees, they're all the same. They, start at the start of the war, had about 187,000 soldiers. Now, by the end of the war, you have nearly 3 million men total who fought. 850,000 of them fought for the Confederacy. The North used 2.1 million men during the course of the war. That's five years. African Americans fought for the Union, approximately 200,000, and about 10,000 Hispanics also fought in the conflict. Now, as in other wars, both sides expected the war to end quickly. Some leaders thought it would be a long one, but General William Tecumseh Sherman predicted a very, very long war, and he was one of the few generals who was right. And so in the next sections, we're going to talk about the battles, and we're going to walk through this. So I hope you guys um, have fun listening to me talk you through this keynote. Uh, make sure you do the reading that's assigned on RenWeb and also um, any assignments that are posted in Canvas for you to do. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me, or if you want to set up a Google Meet, I'm happy to do that as well. I hope you guys are well. Stay healthy. Keep learning. Keep practicing your presidents. And uh, make sure you follow the assignments on RunWeb. Thanks, guys. Bye.